Well, what those acronyms are, are really the names of different national modeling teams. So there are very few countries that have the capability to have more than one group creating a climate model. Some countries do. Japan has a couple, I think. The US has a few different teams that tend to collaborate together. Um, but many countries have their own modeling capability. So there are many different global climate modeling groups around the world. And they name their global climate models after their research institute or where they're from. So a CSIRO climate model means that that's a climate model that's built in Australia and run in Australia. And um, doesn't mean that it you know, can only be used in Australia because it's global. CCM is a US community climate, I don't know, I lose track of some of the acronyms. And some of them are very similar. There's a CCM that I think is the US community model, which means different universities collaborate to build the model. And then there's a Canadian model, which is a CCSM or something. So it can be a real alphabet soup of who these, what these models are. But the important thing to know is it's just telling you that it's whose model it is. And it, you should usually use multiple models. So in some sense, it's not so important to remember which acronym stands for what country. But it can be important because models that are run uh, for the southern hemisphere tend to be more accurate for southern hemisphere phenomena. There's some uncoupling across the equator of climate phenomena. And that's reproduced in these models. So when you have a, a modeling team that's based in the Southern Hemisphere, like in Australia or in Brazil, they're likely to do a global model that gets the Southern Hemisphere a little bit better than the Northern Hemisphere. And if you're a modeling team in the Northern Hemisphere in Canada or the US or the UK, your model's going to get the Northern Hemisphere a little bit better than it gets the Southern Hemisphere. And that's not necessarily because they want it to be that way, but it's because none of the models get the coupling across the equator very well. So, and because of where they're based, the models are gonna wanna look better where they are. They don't wanna be showing a politician their model that doesn't look very good for Australia or doesn't look very good for the US just to make it look better everywhere around the world. That's a bit about what we're, like what we were talking about with the satellite imagery, whereas if we tune it for Ethiopia, it's probably not gonna look very good for somewhere in South America. And if we make it average out so it's pretty good everywhere in the world, it's probably not gonna look particularly great in Ethiopia. Well, we have that same sort of tr problem in climate modeling. So that's a long answer to say, that the only time you really need to worry about where these models are from is if you're in a different hemisphere than they are. So, you, you know, if you're in the southern hemisphere, which we're not, you might want to say, well, I'm going to use Brazilian and Aust I'll be sure to use Brazilian and Australian models because they may reproduce the southern hemisphere better than some of these European or, or North American models. And conversely, a lot of studies in the U.S. then are, you know, use U.S. or Canadian models, but they often also try and use Australian or Brazilian models to balance out so that this imbalance across the equator gets used. So you will see lots and lots of these acronyms if you deal with any sort of climate change modeling, and certainly true as well of modeling species. And people now believe that the more cl climate models you use, the better result you get. So people are using 20 or 30 different climate models uh, to get their, their biological results often. And that means you've got 20 or 30 different acronyms out there. So don't let the acronyms bother you. It just means different national modeling teams and we're using a lot of different climate models. Okay, so our image is back up. Here we are in the present. The red map indicates where the model says the species currently has suitable climate to conclude. Yes. This model uh, takes uh, the future distribution of the species, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not current. Uh, some species are uh, temperature sensitive, mm -hmm. so maybe the temperature is changed, so they may be shift somewhere, yep. and this model may tell us. So can the model tell us uh, where exactly the species is found and whether they live that area or not? Right. So that's exactly what we want to look at. So 
The question is, can these models tell you where the species is found? The species has its own climatic tolerances, so as conditions change, the species is likely to move to track those suitable climatic conditions. So we'll talk about that. That's the fundamental principle of climate change biology, and we'll talk more about that when we go into more depth. But for this, just important to know that yes, that's exactly right. The species is going to have climatic tolerances, and as climate changes, we'll see a change in where we expect the species to be. And that's why we take the information from the global climate model, put it into the species model or niche model, and then ask, where, where might this species be in the future? And for the future right now, we're going to think about 2050. So these models I'll show are for 2050. Sometimes people do end of the century, like 2080. But this is a good, you know, 30, 40 years from now uh, are the simulated climates we're dealing with. And so that looks like this. And so you were mentioning that the species may try and track suitable climate as things warm. Well, that's exactly the case, and we see, at least in this part of the species range, that it's moving from these lowlands up into the Cape Fold Mountains. This is about where the corner of the L is in the Cape Fold Mountains. So one part of the mountain's going this way, one part is going this way, and this species is going up into that corner of the Cape Fold Mountains, and it's going up because it wants to track its suitable climate as conditions warm. Now, it may be responding to precipitation as well, but a lot of this upslope shift would be due to temperature effect. Town. Toggle back and forth. Yes, yes. So let's go back and forth between present and future. Okay, there's present. I'll just do this a couple of times. And, and just to preview where we're going with this. So this is red is current, future is 2050 in this, okay? So we're seeing two time steps, present, future, present, future. The next thing we're going to do is break it up into smaller time steps and ask where it might be in each step along the way. So instead of just having two points, we're going to have five points. It'll go present, 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, and you'll see how that works. So just visualize how this is working with just two endpoints, and then we'll add some other points along the way so we can see how a species may react um, decade by decade. There's a question, I think, Tina. Yeah. I was expecting uh, species would shift to higher latitudes rather than longitudes. Uh-huh. Why? why why is it going south instead of north? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the question is, we were thinking that it would be going to higher latitudes. Why don't we see more of that? Well, two things to be clear about is that this is the southern hemisphere now, so that moving towards the pole will be uh, to the south. So we're seeing, I think, some of that shift if we look at this. Here's the present distribution. And here's the future. So the southernmost point of this species suitability hasn't gone very far south. There's a little bit over here you can see. So there's been a little bit of movement south, but there's been a lot of loss to the north. And that's because it's cooler here and warmer there. So as things warm, the species is going to move towards the pole, towards cooler conditions. If it was north of the equator, it'd be going the other way, right? So, you know, in the U.S., we have to always stop ourselves because we're in the northern hemisphere, and we tend to say the species is going to move north and upslope. Well, in the northern hemisphere, that's right. But in the southern hemisphere, that's wrong. The species in the southern hemisphere is going to move to the south and upslope, but it's doing the same thing in both cases, and moving towards the pole, trying to get towards cooler areas because climate is warming. Um, so, and we're seeing both of those things here, right? So we're losing suitable climate for the species where it's warmer because things are getting too warm for the species there, which is forcing it to shift southward in this case. But it's also moving upslope into the Cape Fold Mountains, which are those mountains we saw in the satellite image. So it's doing both the things we expect. and. Uh, the other thing to note here is that there's not a lot of, of 
space to go. This is ocean down here, right? This is the Cape Point. And so this species doesn't have a lot of room to go south. And it's going to tend, many species that, that we'll see in this modeling tend to go upslope because there's basically no land to move into to the south. So that's a kind of a quirk of the Cape, but consistent with what we expect. Bilal. So um, one of the things about this future projection is, could you talk a little bit more about the, the range of different variables? So one assumes a 2050 and a current. Right? And you're going to talk about the time scales in between, but could you talk also a bit about the uncertainty associated with different levels of uncertainty at different times? Sure. So the question is, um, what are the levels of uncertainty associated with the data at different times? So there's a lot to be said there, but uh, the simplest thing to say is that the uncertainty is least in the present because we have at least information that's interpolated from uh, observed temperature and precipitation records. And then as we get into the future, the uncertainty increases. So just as a weather forecast uh, becomes m more and more uncertain as we get farther and farther into the future. So the weather forecasting people recognize that and generally limit their forecasts to 10 days, but they may also do a 30-day or 60-day forecast. But everybody knows that you have to take those 30 and 60-day forecasts with a big grain of salt because the models don't do very well the longer they run. And the same thing is true for climate models. The longer we get away from the historical record, the more uncertainty we have. And that's why people use 20 or 30 different global climate models, because nobody knows what the right future is. And it, there's actually evidence that if you tend to average all these models together, all the errors tend to average each other out, and you get a, a bit better result using a lot of different GCMs than you do if you use only one. Um, and we can talk about how you select GCMs. One thing is you would think that you'd look for a GCM that reproduces the region you're in best, and you'd use that GCM. You'd look at how well it matches the historical record, and then choose GCMs, global climate models, that match your regional historical climate well. Turns out that that doesn't particularly perf improve performance of uh, models, but using a lot of models, 20 or 30 models, does improve performance. Now, I, that's counterintuitive, but that's just the way it is. Question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, what about the adaptations? Is there the climate change? Uh huh. Is there uh, any uh, variables which leads to the adaptation? Okay, so adaptation. Well, this is, we're taking a while to get there, but where we're going to get to is adaptation. So there, let's explain what adaptation is in climate change lingo first. So there are two principal terms in climate change jargon, which are mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation means uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions especially industrialized countries, but also including reducing deforestation, reducing the gases that cause climate change. That's called mitigation. The second term is adaptation, and adaptation is what we do to respond to climate change. Uh, there's a greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere, climate change is underway, we're going to experience climate change that can't be stopped, and we're, we're going to have to do something to change the way we live or produce food or manage our protected areas to, uh, to adapt to those climate changes, and that's adaptation. But your question's about, so, but for species, it's a, a little trickier. Generally, when we use adaptation, we're talking about what people can do, right? There's also a biological concept of adaptation, which is to say, can the species adapt to climate change? Um, and we'll look at both of those ty types of adaptation, the species' ability to adapt to climate change and our ability to adapt our reserve management or our protected area management to capitalize on those natural capabilities to help conserve the species. Um, okay, but your question was about sort of the natural adaptation, the species' ability to adapt. So we'll go back and cover this, this good preview of what we'll talk about when we go into more detail about climate change biology. 
but the vast majority of evidence about what's happened with species in the past is the way they've adapted to climate change is by moving. So we believe that the, the, the most likely response, the most likely adaptation in terms of species is to move in response to climate change. Now, there's some evidence of genetic adaptations to climate change, uh, but interestingly, many of those actually are adaptations to move more quickly. So for instance, there's evidence that certain trees have longer winged seeds uh, when they're in an area of climate change. So, and similarly, there's some longer winged insects that exist in it, and that longer winged form is expressed more when climate is changing. So there do seem to be some genetic adaptations as well, but many of those are related to moving. So moving is the most important thing to focus on, and, and just to keep things simple, that's what, what we'll focus on here as well. Um, but certainly some species may not be able to move now. If, if you're in the reserve that where we were this morning and you would need to move to track climate change, you've got agricultural land all around you and there's not gonna be anywhere to move. So um, two things, one is that good reserve management may help species in that situation. Uh, but the other thing is that species may be put through sort of evolutionary bottlenecks that they've never faced before because there were more natural landscapes around to move around in. And so we may not know exactly uh, what the genetic adaptation capacity of species is because they've never been put to a test like, like we're about to put them through. Uh, both in terms of the speed and magnitude of climate change that humans are putting the planet through, but also because we've changed uh, mostly natural landscapes into human-dominated landscapes in many places, and there's not going to be places to move necessarily. But we're going to look at, I'm going to use these models. So these models aren't, you know, to tell us exactly what the future is. These models are to help us think about what the future may hold and ask ourselves how we might want to respond. And that's exactly how we're going to use them here. So I'm going through this background just so when I show you the model results, you'll understand where it came from and we can ask ourselves, well, how might we respond to, uh, to this sort of movement? So let's, let's do our back and forth. Okay, here's the current distribution, the current model distribution of the species. We don't know exactly what its current distribution is. We have data points, the black points, but the red is the current model distribution. And here is the future model distribution. Now if I go back and forth just a couple more times, I'd like to ask you to keep your eyes on this area right near Cape Town, because while we're losing a lot of the current range, there's that area right around Cape Town that's holding on. Does so everybody sort of see how a lot of this area is area that was red in the previous slide? If you just sort of focus right there on that, that cluster of black dots, there's red there now and there's blue there in the future, which means both in the present and future, that species is present. So I could pose this as a question, but I'll just say it. That's the sort of thing you want to look for if you want to conserve the species, right? Is a place where it might have suitable habitat now and will have suitable habitat in the future. That minimizes the species necessity to move around. Um, this is an interesting example of that as well, because you might say, well, this is Cape Town. So that species is in trouble because these points are somewhere in a city and the, f the current range that's in the city probably doesn't exist and the future range isn't going to do the species any good because it's in a city. But in fact, Table Mountain National Park sits right above Cape Town. So this cluster of points, the black points, are all records from weekend hikers going through Table Mountain National Park. And so if there's good news in this slide, in this diastella, that's losing lots of range, it seems, in, the, in its modeled range in the future, one piece of good news is the place where the suitability is retained is in an area that's protected. And that's good for our purposes because it means that the species may be able to hold on in Table Mountain <coughs> National Park. Okay, and I think, anybody wanna see those present, future, again, any other questions before we go on? 